I am who he says I am. I'm chosen. I'm not forsaken. I am who he says I am. Now, that's what you yell to me. That's what you yell to God. I'm going to challenge you with that this morning. Are you who God called you to be? Are you walking in the victory that he has for you? But most importantly, are you a child of the king? I'm also going to encourage you this morning because I don't know about you, but I need a fresh word from God. This week has been kind of challenging for me. A lot of bumps, a lot of twists, a lot of turns, but I'm still standing. And my prayer for you is whatever you're bringing in the house of God, he has an answer for you in his word. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus. Settle our spirits, settle our minds and our hearts. Open up our ears, Father God. Give us a fresh word this morning so that we can apply it to our lives. We know that you have chosen us because if you didn't chose us, we wouldn't have chosen us. We wouldn't have been here this morning, whether in the building or online. So we're here. Holy Spirit, have your way in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past couple of weeks, we have been in this series entitled Identity, and our goal as pastors is to help you understand who you are in Jesus Christ, the fundamentals of the gospel of Christianity. And in week one, we answer the question, what is a Christian? In the teaching, we showed you that the word Christian came out of, originated from Acts chapter 11 because people were following, people were being imitators and giving Jesus Christ all that they had. So they created the word Christian. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, there's two things that you must do. You must believe in him and turn towards him. Acts chapter 11 says, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed, here it is, and turned to him. Once you believe in Jesus Christ and turn towards him, you are saved. Salvation is secure. Amen. Last week, Pastor Steve talked about and answered the question, can I lose my salvation? And to answer that question, we dove into some complicated texts. We explored, we examined the Holy Scriptures, and we concluded that once you are saved in him, you can't lose your salvation. The question shouldn't be, can I lose my salvation? The question is, is did I ever have it in the first place? Because if you had, Christ in you in the first place, your life will be totally different. Once you're in Christ, you can't lose the gift that God has given you. How do I know that? It says in John 10, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Here it is. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Once you're in Christ, you're in the family of God. Next week, we're going to conclude the series, and we're going to answer the question, how can I be sure I'm saved? But that's for next week. This week, I want to answer this question. What about good deeds? What is the relationship between faith and works. And what is my responsibility as a Christian to show the world that I'm on God's team? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to James chapter 2. Here, James, the apostle, he's a leader within the church. He's a half-brother of Jesus Christ. He's writing to a people who are scattered. He's writing to Christians. 
And he's trying to encourage them to say, hey, despite persecution, despite the martyr of Stephen, we are still good to go. Jesus is still on our side. But he also is challenging them to get out of the seats that they're sitting in because they have become complacent. He says, if faith is truly in you, then it should be evident by your works. And we're going to pick up on verse 14, and it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save them? Now, in his letter, in his epistle, James identifies brothers and sisters 15 times in this letter. And what it literally means is a part of God's family. So what he's saying is because you are part of God's family, you and I have a responsibility to take the good news to the streets. We're called to be the hands and feet of him who saved us. He starts this conversation with a rhetorical question. He says in 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such a faith save them? To understand this phrase, this discussion, this passage, you have to lean in to what it says, if someone claims. What James is saying, you may claim it, but I don't see it in your actions. You're all talk, no bite. But then he goes on to say, can such faith save them? I think a better translation is this, can that kind of faith save? Now, you're looking at me strange. You're like, wait a second, Pastor. You just told us last week that it's by grace and grace alone that we're saved. Now, you tell me I have to work for my faith? That's not what I'm saying. Pastor, you said in Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, are you saying James is saying one thing and Paul is saying the other? Are they contradicting each other? The answer is no. They're complementing one another. In Ephesians 2, Paul is teaching that a person or a sinner receives salvation by faith and grace alone, and it's simply a gift. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. It's just simply given to you. On the other hand, what James is saying in chapter 2 is simply this. If you have faith, you should show it through your actions. You're supposed to bring heaven to earth. You're supposed to win souls for Christ based on what I see in you. So now, here comes the challenge in verse 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. Now, you may be thinking that James is hitting him on the head saying, what is wrong with you? No, he's bringing him into alignment to what God's word is saying. He said, you're supposed to be the hands and feet. You preach the word, but you also touch the wounds. I like how the message Bible unpacks this. Listen to how the message translates it. Dear friends, do you think you're going anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but nothing, you do never do nothing? Excuse me. Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and you say, good morning friend, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Spirit. And walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageously nonsense? He says, preach the word and touch the wounds. If a brother or sister is hungry, don't just give them a sermon. Give them a rib sandwich and a Pepsi. (laughs) Uh, 
at least that's what I like. Maybe it's grilled cheese for you with iced tea. Whatever it is, we're supposed to take the gospel and our faith to the world. He goes on to say, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. Here it is. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that. And cowered in fear. James is my type of pastor. He cuts to the chase. He's not trying to woo you with words. He tells it like it is. He gets in their face. He tells them, this is what you're doing. This is what you're not doing. And if you love Christ, these are the things you should be doing. He doesn't give them good feel words. He says, hey, we have a mission. We have an assignment. And God has saved us, so we must go out and save the world in Christ. Simply put, if you're going to be a Christian, be a real Christian. Again, he says, even the demons believe that. Verse 20, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? He's simply saying you're getting complacent. You're acting foolish. Get in the game. Get in God's race because you have a responsibility to take the word to the world. Because of what Christ has done in you and what he's done in me. To make his point, he brings out two people in the Old Testament. One is Abraham, the father of faith, and the other one is Rahab, the prostitute. Look at y'all. Half y'all just turn y'all nose up. The prostitute. See, that he's talking to y'all. Look at verse 21. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Abraham is the perfect example of a biblical hero whose faith was married to his works. I want you to understand how God called Abraham out of the world. Abraham wasn't always the father of faith. In fact, he was a rich man, a wealthy man, living in the city of Ur. He had everything at his disposal. He was comfortable. He was living just fine. Out of nowhere, God gets his attention. He says, there's something better for you. I have more for you. I need you to leave everything that you know and chase me. Could you do that? Could you just give up everything and go somewhere that you have no idea where you're going? That's why he is the epitome of faith. And then he said, if you go, I promise I will give you a son. You will produce more seeds and you will be the father of many nations. But it's going to start with the seed or the baby or the child that you don't have yet. Do you trust me enough to step out on faith? Abraham simply says, yes. Years later, God delivers. He brings Abraham and Sarah, Isaac. And you think it should be all fine from there. And then all of a sudden, God gets his attention again. He says, I want you to slay your son. I want you to kill him. Could you do that? But he obeyed anyway. And because he obeyed, look at verse 15 of Genesis 22. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as a sand on the seashore. 
Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. Many of us are missing the blessings of God because we just won't step out on faith. God has more in store for you. God wants to do more for you. But many of us, including myself, sometimes it's hard to step out on faith. But that wasn't the father of faith. And because he did that, you and I have a connection with God because of him. What about Rahab? Verse 25 says, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? I'm going to tap more on her story later, but what Rahab... She did something for two people that she didn't know to a God she's never met before because her faith pushed her to it. In Joshua chapter 2, God has been walking with Israel. He got him up out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They won battle after battle. And now the eyes are set on Jericho, on the promised land. And what's interesting is, is Joshua, the leader at the time, sends two spies to go survey the land. They get to the doorstep of the harlot or the prostitute, Rahab. She comes in or they come in. She introduces herself. I don't know how. We don't know that. But all we know is she began to converse with them. And next thing you know, God began to do a work, and she keeps them secure and safe and gets them home so that God can finish the purpose. Same is true for you and I. Whether you can identify with Rahab or with Abraham or somewhere in between, James says this, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What can we glean from these 12 verses? How can we apply them to our lives? How can we be the Christians that God called us to be? The first thing I picked up out of this text was simply this. He wants to call you out of the crowd. Many of you in here are not saved. Many of you in here think you're saved, but you're not saved. You looked apart, you talked apart, you dressed apart, but you know and I know that you're not saved. But here's the deal, that's okay because you're in the right place. He wants you and I to come out of the crowd. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look through the story of these two powerhouses in the in God. Let's start with Abraham. Abraham is first introduced in Scripture in Genesis chapter 12. Listen at these words. It says, the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be blessed. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Before Abraham was Abraham, he was Abram. He was minding his own business in a country that was all hmm, kind of like Vegas. <laughs> he had money in his hands, money in his pocket. According to world standards, he was doing quite fine. But despite all of that, he stepped out on faith. God met him where he was. Despite of everything that he had, he still felt something was missing. And it appears that Yahweh was the answer. Because the Bible says he stepped out on faith. He trusted God at his word, 
And God continued to show him blessing after blessing after blessing. He was called the friend of God. He's called the father of faith. And because and through his seed, many nations have been blessed because he believed. In fact, Genesis 15 says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That's why he is the epitome of faith. He left it all to chase God. What about Rahab? How did God get her attention? Look at verse 1 in Joshua 2. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. They didn't go to the house to be entertained. They went to Jericho because they had a mission. God promised Israel that that was going to be their land, their country, flowing milk and honey. They went on God's word by faith. Do you think it's a coincidence or happenstance that God sent these two men to a prostitute's house? I don't think so. Because on a normal day, different people came within the house. But something stood out about these two spies. I don't know if they were their language or their dialect or what they were wearing. All I know is it got Rahab's attention. And she started with a conversation and she began to realize that, wait a second, these people have been with the God, Yahweh. She said, I heard many things about you guys. I heard how God delivered you from the hands of Pharaoh. I heard how God dried up the red sea so that you would cross over. I heard how God kept you and fed you and clothed you in the wilderness. I heard that you took out two kings. Now here you are. Verse 9 says of Joshua 2, and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. She says, I'm not stupid. If God got you through all of that, it's only a matter of time before you take over this place. And because of that, I'm going to trust, even though I never met him before, I won't end. And many of you in here have not met God before and been introduced to Christ. You watch it online. You have not been, but something about somebody came across you. A smile. Taking someone out to lunch. And they said, I want what you got. And it was counted to her as faith. Look at Hebrews 11. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. See, many of you think you got to come here with everything in your hand. I got to clean myself up. I'm not, I, I really want to come to church. Will God accept me like this? P Pastor, you don't know what I've done. Can he really use me? I murdered someone. I raped someone. I'm a child molester. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. Those are strong words, huh? Will God really save? Yes. 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 It doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with the consequences. Let's get clear. You're going to deal with what you did. But in Christ, in Christ alone, he wants to call you out. How do I know that? Look at math. Look at John 6. No one come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. Is God calling you? Is God 
drawing you out of the crowd? Is God trying to get your attention? Only you know that answer. But here's the deal with God. He's not going to force himself on you. He didn't force himself on Rahab nor on Abram. He just presented them with an opportunity. Just like God is presenting you with an opportunity right now if you are in the crowd, but he wants you to come out. But he wants your yes. How do I know that? Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not if, you will. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. All he wants is your yes. You and he will figure it out in the future. He just wants your yes. As the praise team said, do you have a yes in your spirit? I pray that you do. And if you do, later on in the service, I'm going to help you get to that relationship with him. That's the first thing I see. Here's the second thing I see. God wants to deepen our relationship with him, our commitment to him. James is lovingly guiding the sheep to where they're supposed to be. He's saying many of you have become complacent because out of fear, because of people getting murdered and being forced in prison, they're being persecuted. He says, despite all that, what did Christ do on the cross for us? And we're not experiencing any of that. So now he's encouraging them, but he's also challenging them. And this is for those who are in Christ. Just because you're saved doesn't mean the work is done. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. What does it mean to have a vibrant faith in Christ? Let's look back to the examples. Let's look at Abraham. He continued to commit himself to Yahweh. God told him to go, he went. He left his country land to go to a foreign land. He went to Canaan. From there, he went to Egypt. God said, okay, pack your tent, go back to Canaan. Sit there, settle there for a while. Make yourself comfortable because I'm going to give this to your descendants. He believed by faith. He kept him engaged. And Abraham continued to communicate with God. He said, I'm going to promise you, I got a son for you. Because you're trusting, because you are so committed to me, I'm going to give it to you. Look at Genesis chapter 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac, to the son Sarah born. They waited 25 years for this promise. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. They were both past, oh, you say, oh Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord, Jesus, yeah. They said her womb was dried up, but God. And God wants to give you and I more. But are you committed? Are you all in with him? Or you just pick him up and put him down. You're not committed, but here, they're committed. Abraham was so committed, the son that he promised, when God said, now give me your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. Abraham said yes. That's deep. When you read scripture, if you really take the time to read it, that's deep. Could you imagine taking your only child? God wakes you up in the middle of the night. I want you to sacrifice your one. 
your one son. You just get up, pack your bags, and I'm going to show you the mountain of where it's going to happen. As you're going up the mountain, your child says, "Uh, Dad, Mom, I see the firewood. (laughs) I see the fire. But where is the sacrifice? Now, for me, listen, listen, you're talking too much. I'm trying to be focused. God will provide. That was the faith of Abraham. But what about Isaac? Some think when you see son, you think he's a five or six-year-old kid. That's not true. At this time, he's about 17 to mid-20s. Now, if my daddy was going to take me up the mountain and I say, I don't see a lamb. And you're going to tell me God's going to provide. At that time, Abraham was about 117, 125 years old. I think he could have beat his daddy up. (laughs) Amen. And ran down that mountain. But he didn't. When it comes to your faith, Are you teaching your kids the right way? Are you dropping your kids off in kids' ministry and you go home so you can have your me time? That's not you because you're in here. (laughs) Do you pray to God saying, God, I need you to help my child. I'm trusting you. I'm going to give him or her to you. It's all about Jesus. And you get home and they say one word, you just snap. Or you go to school. You listen to your Christian music, listen to the podcast and all those things. You get out of the car, you get on the campus, the college campus. What's up, what's up, what's up? (laughs) Or are you committed in public, but also in private. Here, Abraham was both. And because he was committed to God, God blessed him. He did more for Abraham than what he had previously. And many of us are missing the blessings because truth is we're just fearful. Step out on faith. What about Rahab? I love her story. You got to really understand the situation she was in. The Bible declares she was a prostitute. I don't think anyone wants to be a prostitute. And when you think of a prostitute, you're just thinking about women. But there are male prostitutes. She had a secure life. She owned her own home. It appears that she was a great businesswoman. (laughs) But she always had a heart of gold. She, She thought about her family. She said, I know you guys are coming. And it's not safe for us. (laughs) But I believe that the true God is leading you. And if you'll just save me and my family. I make it work. She could have had her head chopped off because she went against the king of Jericho. She could have had her family killed by her disobedience, but it didn't matter to her because she stepped out on faith more and more and more. Listen to what she did next in verse 15. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself there three days until they return and then go your way. She did not just say, I heard. She continued to commit herself to this new cause. She said, I'm going to let you down down this rope. I need you to tuck yourself away in these these bushes. They're going to be gone for three days. They're going to come back and that's your way to get back. Now, remember what you said. I just need you to take care of me and my family. 
They said, okay, because of your faith, because you're committed, I need you to put this string up in the window, and we come and take over, we're going to spare your life. Look at Joshua 6. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family, and all belonged to her, because she hid the man Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Because she was committed, God used her for a greater purpose. And if you are committed in Christ, he's going to do something extraordinary in your life. You just got to continue to step out on faith. God wants us to deepen our commitment with him. When we refer to the gospel, we usually think of salvation as an event. I was saved but it's a bigger process than that. We call that sanctification. You learned that word last week. Sanctification has two definitions. One means to be set apart for God's use. Holy. The other part is he's sanctifying you. He's perfecting you until the day of Christ. You're never going to be sinless. He wants you to sin less. That's the key. Not perfection, sinning less. Why? Because he wants to take you to higher heights in glory. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being, here it is, transformed into his image with every increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. What am I saying? God wants to take you from glory to glory. He wants to take you to the next level. But in order to do that, you and I, I'm included, we have to commit ourselves more to him. Amen. So the first thing is, are you out of the crowd? Second, deepen our commitment. Here's the one I really want you to hit. Connect with the community. That's what James is saying. I need to see faith in action. He gives us two examples. I got to look in your eyes now. He gives us two examples of how we can have a deeper relationship with God. He gives us the example of Rahab. And on the end of the other spectrum, at the end of the spectrum, he gives us Abraham, where are you in between? He says, I want you to connect with your community. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. I don't tell what somebody said you can't be, but God. There's two parts of connecting with the community. Once you're saved and once you're moving in the things of God, He wants you to go outside these walls and be the hands and feet of him. He wants you to tell the world you can do better. He wants you to tell your family members, your neighbors, your schoolmates, your teacher, your mother, your father, you can be greater than you think you are. You can get off those drugs. You can leave that alcohol alone. You can put that pornography down. You don't have to be a liar. You don't have to be an adulteress. You don't have to be a cheat. God has more. He wants to use us as an example. We're the light and the salt of the earth. And as we show and share Christ, you saw peace. You know what the Peace Center is doing right now? That is the biggest ministry that's happening in Sunrise Church. Because we're touching the word, we're preaching the word, and we're touching the wounds. And because of that, people are coming to Christ. And God gets the glory. That's the first part. Excuse me, there's also a second part. He wants us to surround ourselves in community. Hebrew 10 says, forsake not the assembly of others do. We're called to encourage and inspire one another in the word of God. 
What are you doing in the community of God? Are you serving in the community? Are you plugged into the community? Are you part of a life group? Are you leading a life group? Have you taken rooted? Are you part of anything outside of sitting in the chair eating popcorn? Being a consumer. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying it like it is. God wants you to pour into people. Why? Because when you do that, it makes you better. You see the story? Rahab was just an harlot by herself. God knows what was happening. Abram was okay where he was, so he thought, but something was missing. What's missing in your life? I first want to talk to those who are not in the community of God. Your life is never going to get better. Hear me when I say this. Until you give it to God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall have everlasting life. You're not existing or you are existing, you're not living. You're surviving, not living. In Christ, he wants to give you the abundant life, Jesus says. If that's you, I want to pray for you right now. Because I don't think everyone is saved. And according to James, many people think they're saved, but they're not. You can tell based off their works, but only you know that. Let's all just close our eyes and bow our head. I'm speaking to you now. Don't be ashamed. God called you out of the crowd. He wants you to do something new. If this is where you are today, God can make beauty out of ashes. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repeat after me in the silence of your heart, but here's the deal. You have to be sincere. Say, Father God, I'm broken. I believe you sent your son just for me. I need help. I believe the words of the pastor. Come into my heart. Begin to change me from the inside out. I'm going to commit my life to you today. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's your prayer, I want to say congratulations. I want to say welcome to the family of God. I want to ask something of you. I need you to text next at 909-281-7797. We have people behind the scenes that want to have a conversation with you. Or on your bulletin, on your program, you can check, I say yes to Christ. Tear that off and put it into the offering bag when they come by. But if you're very courageous, if you're very bold, I want you to go out there to the next step table and let the person know what you did today. Why? So we can help you to your next steps. What about the rest of us? God wants more of our commitment He wants us to love him more. He wants us to love people more. He wants us to surround ourselves with the community outside these walls, but also with each other. Are you plugged into a life group? If not, why not? Have you been baptized? If not, why not? Are you part of a small group? After service, we start this next Wednesday. There's different things you can get involved in. We want to give you the tools you need to be a better person in Christ. It says that God is drawing us. The more we chase after him, the more he draws us. Let that be your mission. Let that be my mission. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for each person in this room. Their hearts for you. They're here for a reason. Open up our minds and our hearts so that we can be better men and women just for you. And when we fall, Father God, may we dust ourselves off and get up and get back in the fight. I pray for each family here. I pray for each person here. I pray that we look for you for all things because you have the winning ticket. As we begin to shift gears, Father God, and Collect tithes and offering. Bless those who give. 
but also bless those who want to give, but they have nothing to give. May they give you their heart first. But if they're going to give something, the Bible says, you've robbed me through tithes and offering. At the end of the day, that's the conversation between you and them. But at the end of the day, we require to be good stewards over your finances. And whatever comes into us, Father God, may we use it for kingdom building, oh God. Winning souls for Christ. That's our prayer. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen Amen and amen. God bless you.